Hi, this is Sean Cahill, and you're listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy, and I am joined today on the pod by an Associate Professor of Physics at the University of Albany, former NASA research scientist, lead scientist of UAPX, and also a member of the Natural Sciences Advisory Board for the Sol Foundation. All this among many professional and academic achievements. I'd like to welcome finally to the podcast, Dr. Kevin Knuth. Kevin, welcome to the pod. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I- and I appreciate the kind introduction. Um, I, have a, I have a little correction to make, and it's a good one. Um, Go I'm on. now full professor of physics. So over the last year, I was promoted to full professor, which I treat as a pretty nice accomplishment, given that I was promoted while studying UFOs. So it is that's pretty good. Do you know, normally I could go back and correct that and make myself sound better, but I think the fact you were promoted while studying UFOs deserves to be left in. So uh, well done on that. And that's that's something that will probably come up during the body of the interview. Um, Kevin, let's let's go over your own background, first of all, because you have a quite storied list of achievements academically and professionally. Your introduction could have went on five minutes if I'd listed everything, so I've had to cut it down. Um, but what is your own background and how did you come to be involved in the UFO topic from that? Right. I, I, I've always been interested in UFOs. I was 12 years old back in 1977 when Star Wars came out. So that was made a big impression on me. And I'm old enough to just barely remember the moon landings. I was four years old when, um, in 1969 when they first walked on the moon. And I remember um, we went to my grandmother's house to watch it on television and we were leaving and my father was carrying me down the stairs outside and he got to the bottom of the sidewalk and we stopped and he looked up at the moon and pointed at it and said, there are people up there. And I remember that had such a huge impression, made such a huge impression on me. And um, I've always wanted to go to the moon. Um, and it was a big disappointment that we didn't keep going. Um, I'm looking forward to the upcoming moon launches, but so I've always been interested in these things. And um and I, and I grew up watching Star Trek. I remember getting up, not being able to sleep, and coming out and laying on the couch with my parents watching Star Trek late at night. And um, as a five-year-old, I was a little confused by Spock with his pointy ears. I, I didn't quite understand why there was a giant elf on the bridge of the Enterprise. But <laughs> so, so I was pretty young. But these things all made a big impression on me. And, and in 1977, you know, there was a TV show in search of with uh, Leonard Nimoy hosted that. And they very often covered UFOs. And we pretty much had that running on television every night while we had dinner and so, or just after dinner. So, so I was always interested in UFOs. But I think the, uh, a turning point was um, when I started graduate school. Well, I grew up in Wisconsin and then moved out to Montana uh, for graduate school. I uh, got my master's degree at Montana State University. And it was probably, it was about the first two weeks of classes, um, just having moved out there. So this would have been early September um, 1988. And um, there was a cattle mutilation in Bozeman where two cows were killed and they were surgically altered or messed with. I don't know what the appropriate verb is there. Um, but the and it's and now I know more about cattle mutilation. So it's a classic cattle mutilation. And um, <clears throat> and several of us graduate students, new graduate students, were talking about this in the physics department hallway the next day because this was all over the news and there were UFO sightings the night before. And so the news people are all hyped up. It's either aliens or Satanists. And, um, and I remember arguing that in the hallway. I don't know why an alien would do this. And I'm not sure why that a Satanist could. <laughs> and so I was, I remember saying that in the hallway, but we had this very heated discussion mainly because we knew the new graduate students were trying to figure out what crazy place we just moved to. Right. We were looking down the barrel of living here for five years and um, it was a bit worrisome. And so while we're having this discussion, we disturbed one of the professors who came out of his office and came down the hall to see what we were talking about. And I think he 
tried to console us and said, well, it didn't work. I mean, basically said, well, these things happen from time to time and they investigate them and no one ever figures anything out. And then we all just forget about it until it happens again. And I was just kind of like, what? <laughs> this is crazy. And, um, and then he added, at the end of that, he added, but you know what's really strange is what's really strange is I have friends who are in the Air Force up at Malmstrom Air Force Base, and they're having problems up there with UFOs flying over the nuclear weapon sites and shutting down our nuclear missiles. And he told us this, and he walked away, and I'll be honest, we laughed our butts off because um, – None of us could imagine that that could really be going on and the Air Force wouldn't be on, you know, high alert, right? Um, shooting everything out of the sky that comes anywhere near the base. So it was, it just seemed kind of silly. And so that was back in 1988 that I heard about that. And so now fast forward about almost 30 years, it was probably around 2015, I was teaching a course in astrophysics, or it was an astronomy course, and my students were interested in, we were going to talk about astrobiology, and my students wanted to know what I could say about the possibility of aliens visiting Earth. And I didn't know what to talk about other than the Frank, the, the Frank, Frank Drake's equation or, um, or um, the Fermi paradox. So I was just poking around on the internet just for an idea of what I could even talk about that would make any kind of sense in a physics class. And I stumbled on the press conference that Robert Hastings held in DC in uh, 2010, where he had um, several people, former Air Force people, talking about UFO incursions at nuclear weapon sites. And the first person he had speak was Robert Salas, who was at Malmstrom Air Force Base, the same Air Force Base I had heard about. And I thought, and I was just dumbfounded. I thought, this is amazing. I heard about this, I heard about this 25 years ago from a physics professor. And here, here, this is the guy, this is a guy from the Air Force Base talking about an event that occurred in 1965 or 1966. And I thought, this can't be nonsense. This has to be real because these are serious people. You know, serious people just don't maintain stories like this for, you know, for 40 years. Um, that's not reasonable. And then it kind of struck me, I, it kind of sank in listening to these discussions um, on this press conference that, we're in a bit of trouble because no one's taking this seriously. And this is very possibly extremely serious. And I, and I, and it just really started to worry me. Um, and what did I talk about that next day in class? I, I made the horrible mistake. I showed the students part of that video and I think I scared the bejesus out of them. I <laughs> mean, they were all white faced and ashen with their eyes open when it was done. And um, I didn't really even talk about anything. I just played part of that video. And then I had apologized profusely because I realized that they did not see that coming. And, um, had, and I think the seriousness of the situation really hit them like, like a ton of bricks. I think that was a little too rough. Um, but it but it compelled me to start studying these things. I thought somebody has to be paying attention. So I started paying attention. So that was 2015. And then it was only two years later, 2017, what was it, December 16th, 2017, that the New York Times article came out about the ATIP program. Yeah. And then I and then I was like, yeah, certainly I need to, I'm going to have to study these things because nobody else is. So the field's wide, the field's wide open. Um, somebody has to be paying attention. And I thought I'll, I'll try to try to do something. And that's how I got involved. That's it's the long story. <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's interesting because it's funny how as a an academic, a scientist, however you want to kind of pigeonhole yourself, there are now more of you, if you include your Gary Nolan, Jacques Vallée, Beatrice Villarreal, all, all of those folks who are coming out more and more. And there are still yeah. so many who are on the opposite end of the spectrum, who poo-poo the subject, who don't want to talk about it. The stigma still, you know, there. Neil deGrasse Tyson's one of the biggest names in the world. He's they a haven't looked into it at all. That's the problem. They haven't even looked at it, um, and they're yeah. poo-pooing it, which is which is why Avi Loeb's Galileo Project is called what it's called. I mean, he called it the Galileo Project because of the bishops that refused to look through Galileo's telescope. And that's how these, you know, these other prominent skeptics are. They're they're not skeptics. They're denialists. They're not they're not being skeptical. Being skeptical is 
being skeptical works both ways. You're skeptical of everything. And so you should be skeptical of, equally skeptical of people who say that there are alien spacecraft in our um, operating in our environment as yeah. you are of people who say that's impossible. Um, you should be skeptical of both. You need evidence is what you need. And that, you know, that requires research and work. And yeah, if you don't want to put the work in on this problem, that's fine. Don't do it. But you can't poo poo people who are. What do you think the difference is, though, as a scientist to to want to explore that and want to investigate that? Um, you mentioned Galileo, and I'll bastardize this, but famously, he was ostracized at the time for believing, for daring to believe the Earth went around the sun and not the other way around. And I know Professor Brian Cox here in the UK, very famous scientist, um, he always cites his hero as Galileo. But on the other hand, he will always say he has no interest in the UFO subject. Aliens aren't coming here. And um, that's a, a broad term I understand, but there's nothing coming here. It's too far away. He just doesn't have an interest in the subject. Yet his hero was ostracized for something very similar back in the time. So it just seems that as a scientist, you would want to be involved in what no doubt would be one of the great discoveries in human history. Isn't that right? I can, as a scientist, Whenever you are confronted with a problem that you're going to consider looking into, um, you have to consider a few things. You, you know, is there is there a chance of success? I, is there any way I can figure this out? Um, can I make any headway here? Um, is this problem for me in some way? And that's an important question to ask. Um, another one is it worth doing? You know, is there is what you're going to discover going to be meaningful at all, or is it not going to be very important? Um, so there's, and, and then how hard is it going to be? How much time is it going, am I going to invest? Um, you have to do your homework. You're going to have to research what other people have done. Um, in this case, there's not a lot of scientific work that's been done, but there are people in ufology who have accumulated information. So they, you know, it's not data like you would want from a science pro, um, project, scientific pro, program, but, um, but it is information that you can learn mm. from. So you have to weigh all of those factors. And I think that, you know, everybody's going to do a slightly different calculus based on their interests and their abilities and their time. And, and it's perfectly fine for a scientist to look at this and say, yeah, there probably isn't anything here. I'm not going to study it. That's, that's fine. But, but to take the next step and be critical of those who decide to study it, I think is a big problem. I mean, that's, that's, that's not being rational at all. And so, um, so it's so, and, and I have several colleagues who are curious about this and they're interested in what's going on, interested in asking me for updates and what they, what I've learned, but, um, but they'll say, yeah, this is interesting, but yeah, not for me. And that's cool. That's fine. Yeah, that's that's a very fair way to put it. Um, I wonder, you, you've mentioned your own background and as, a, as growing up, that very typical childhood interest in the UFO topic, Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, that's how many of us get into this, this subject in a way. Did you have any either sightings or experiences of your own or, or family sightings that also helped progress that? I, I have actually, and I and it's hard because I never treated it as a sighting because I wasn't sure what I was looking at. Um, it was unidentified, right? So I never, so, so I never, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. So I never treated it as a, you know, as something important. Um, I was, at the time I was, I was in college, I was working as a computer programmer at Mercury Marine that makes Mercury outboards for boats. And, um, and I was leaving work and this is my hometown of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And I was leaving work, walking across the parking lot, and I spotted an F-16. And I thought, oh, cool, an F-16. And um, my hometown is is just at the southern tip of Lake Winnebago in Wisconsin. So when you look at Wisconsin, uh, I guess you're seeing that right. Uh, you've got Green Bay here, Milwaukee is down here, and there's this little lake here called Lake Winnebago. And, I'm, and my hometown was right at the foot of that. And up along the west coast of... Um, Lake Winnebago is the town of Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where they used to have, or they used to, they still do, they have the um, Experimental Aircraft Association fly-in, the EAA fly-in. 
every every year you would have um, experimental aircraft come in, world you know a war war um, planes you know from World War Two, World War One, everything. Um, there'd be a hundred thousand people there. It was ginormous, and so my we would go almost every year. My grandfather had taken me, and my father took me, and um, and that happens usually in July of the, in the summer. And so spawning an F-16, it wasn't, so I knew what an F-16 was. I had seen them a million times. I saw this F-16 flying and I thought, cool, an F-16. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, it's June. We're an hour, or an hour, sorry. We're a month early from the EAA. Why is there an F-16 up there? And I I have also a lifelong bird watcher. So I have a pair of binoculars in my car. So I ran to my car, grabbed my binoculars and looked at the F-16 and, and then realized there were two of them. And there are two of them streaking in from the north, and they kind of they kind of split up, and um, I followed one of them, and it came. They both came back around, and they started um, circling, and I realized they were circling an object that was um, spherical. There was a large metal sphere. It was about a third of the length of the F sixteen. So an F sixteen is what one hundred twenty six feet, something like that. So this thing was about forty feet across. Um, and, and at the time I thought it's a weather balloon and these guys are in doing some kind of exercise with a weather balloon. And that was what I imagined. And I watched them fly around this thing like bees. And then two more F-16s came in from the West and there were four of them, four of them just buzzing around this metal sphere, metallic looking sphere. Um, I watched for about three minutes or so. And then I made the big mistake. I thought, my brother has to see this. And so, I mean, I, that's not a mistake. But the mistake was there's we didn't have cell phones. This 19, I, it was either the early June of 88 or June of 87. I don't remember which year, which is hard. Um, and I thought, my brother has to see this. So I got in my car and drove home, which about five, seven minutes to get home. Hopped out of the car, ran in the house, grabbed my brother, took him outside and said, you got to see this. You had these four F-16s are doing some kind of exercise up here. And by the time we got outside to look, it was just a rat's nest of contrails and nothing. There were, I don't know what happened to the sphere. I don't know what happened to the planes. So I don't know what happened. Um, but I always imagined that it was an exercise and it was just a weather balloon. But um, in talking with people from the Air Force later, they, you know, I was told that, well, you, it wouldn't have, the first, there wouldn't have been an exercise over the city. Um, they mm-hmm. wouldn't have been doing that. Um, and there wouldn't have been an exercise involving a weather balloon. You don't fly an F-16 anywhere near a weather balloon because you suck that thing into the air intake and the plane goes down. Yeah. And I thought, well, that makes sense. So what was it? <laughs> and, and everybody I've talked to is like, no idea, <laughs> no idea what it was. But it wasn't an exercise and it wasn't a weather balloon. So um, so it never really felt like I had seen something unusual. But in retrospect, looking at it, I probably had. And um, now, now I wish I'd have been able – I wish I'd have been able to take photos. I wish I'd have watched the whole thing. I wish I'd have that, – that the sphere was stationary. It was just stationary. Mm-hmm. It was a clear blue sky. It just sat there for three minutes, didn't move, didn't do anything. They just buzzed around it like bees. It was very odd. I would like to know, what do you find most intriguing about the UFO topic? You've had that childhood experience, uh, childhood interest, your own sighting, which is a really interesting one. And I think you've done, which many of us have done, where you've had a sighting or experience and you've left before it finished. I done the mm-hmm. same when I was a child, where I saw something interesting, um, pretty low down Ferris wheel type object on its side. Um, I was about ten or eleven years old, and but I was with my mum, my sister, a friend, and his mum, and it wasn't even up in the sky. It was so low down you couldn't see the bottom of the object behind houses that were about half a mile away. Uh, wow. in a very very built up urban area. So yeah, and if it was a Ferris wheel, everyone on on board was dead because of the speed it was was spinning. So, um, but we looked at it, saw it, and then left. It was the mid nineties, so no camera phones, you know, nothing like that as well. But <laughs> right. I always wish we'd stayed a little bit longer uh, and looked at it. Um, my mum, who has no interest in the UFO topic, if I ask her now, she remembers it. But if I ask her even to draw what she saw, she can't remember. All she remembers <laughs> is she saw something really strange. So it, it's an odd one. Um, 
But I wonder, what, what do you find right now, given your involvement, the people you know, the people you speak to, and we're going to get onto the Sol Foundation in just a moment, the most intriguing aspect of the UFO topic? There, there are two things that I find really intriguing. One is, um, the, the most intriguing is their association with water. And, and, and now, according to, you know, um, the, you know, Arrow and Congress, they, the acronym UAP supposedly stands for under or unidentified aerospace underwater phenomena, right, or undersea mm -hmm. phenomena. Um, and that underwater aspect is horribly, horribly neglected. And in fact, um, today, I think um, Admiral... Gaudelet has um, put out, or Gaudelet has put out a um, the Soul's first white paper, which has mm. to do with the undersea aspects or underwater aspects of UFOs. I think that's the most neglected aspect of these things, um, and I and I can say that I had um, over the last year and a half. Me and the UAPX team, uh, we briefed um, Senator um, Gillibrand's team twice. We've briefed the U.S. House of Representatives Armed Services Committee. We briefed Arrow, and we briefed um, the Department of National Intelligence. And they all asked us one question that they had in common, and it was the main question that we were asked was, what are your capabilities for observing underwater? That's what everybody wants to know. And that is clearly the most important aspect of, of UFOs, unidentified flying objects that, that um, there is. Uh, it's the underwater aspect. It's been horribly ignored, and, um, and, but it's, it's clearly the most important aspect. And I, and and I find that fascinating. I was going to just say Admiral Gallaudet's paper. I literally saw the link for it about half an hour before we recorded. So I've not right. had the chance to look over that yet. So if anyone's thinking, ask about it or follow up, I've not read it yet. Um, it has literally just dropped before we hit the record. I barely button. had a chance to look at it. before. I saw it about the same time you did, and I yep. barely had a chance to look at it myself. But I was glad that it came out. Um, because that, I think, is the most neglected aspect of these things, uh, which I find fascinating. And what was the second? We're going to come back to the underwater question. Oh, the second, the second one's the difficult part, and it was um, if you've seen if you've seen me in uh, Netflix's Encounters, mm -hmm. I'm in I'm in episode three of Encounters, and when they um, talk about the sightings in Wales, and um, and the opening scene that I'm in is actually the first thing that we filmed. I didn't even know the cameras were running, which is why I, I, they said that. But the director asked me. Um, tell us a secret, you know, that you haven't told anybody about UFOs. And um, all I could think was on television. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then, but I didn't even know we were running it. I was like, is there the cameras running? I didn't know. And so that's actually what you see in the film. Um, but the second aspect is related to a secret about UFOs. And that is the strange aspect that um, they are people who have witness them or come close to them or claim to have been taken on board all experience weird paranormal phenomena afterwards it's common and that's what people report i you know we don't have hard evidence of this i can't easily go into details i'm not sure what to believe um but that's what people report. And that's very, very odd. I mean, so the, these phenomena range from um, encountering beings that are communicating with them telepath telepathically. I don't know how that works. I'm a scientist. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, but it's widely reported. Uh, people report levitating afterwards, like by themselves when they've been back in the house. They'll be levitating in the kitchen. Um, it's really strange People say strange things. So, you know, are these things really happening to people? I don't know. Are they, um, are they have their brains been messed with or scrambled in some way? Maybe. I don't know. I, I, I really am not at liberty to say what the truth of the situation is. But, but it's 
those aspects of the reports I find very bizarre and very strange. And it's, um, it's hard to know what to think. It would be super easy to just blow it off, right? And say, clearly this is all nonsense, but I don't think it's all nonsense. There's something interesting here because it's widely reported across cultures, across time. Um, and those are the things you pay attention to. That's where, well, that's where you learn stuff, but. Absolutely, yeah. We're going to come back to those, okay? And I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, anyone watching just saw me move to the side. I was just making a little note to come back to to both of those points. But I've got questions that are going to come up to those. Um, so let's go to the Sol Foundation presentation. Um, you talked about the physics of UAP. I love that you corrected yourself though and said, "Look, they're UFOs." Let's talk about UFOs because I prefer the term UFO because that's what we're talking about here. Um, that's what I'm interested and, in. Those are the underwater ones, the USOs, right? <laughs> absolutely, and. The they're all one in the same, potentially. Uh, you started your presentation with the line, I am sceptical, and that isn't a bad thing. Um, I remember Lou Elizondo, when he was first doing his rounds on the podcast circuit and media, was telling people to be sceptical. You know, you don't have to believe him. Look at the data, listen exactly. to everyone, make up your own mind. Um, why do you feel then, as a scientist, or, or even anyone who has a basic interest in the UFO topic, why is being sceptical not a bad thing? It's to be, it's, it's a safeguard about against being wrong. Um, that's really all it is. You can't accept all, everything you're told at face value, even from your, even from your instruments, you don't do that. You ca you, you know, when you're doing measurements in the lab, you calibrate your instruments, you test them, and then you take your measurements and then you calibrate them again and test it again to make sure that they're telling, telling you what you, they think, what you think they're telling you. Um, that's what, that's, that's what you have to do to make sure that you're not wrong. And it's true with anything. And, um, and that kind of being skeptical is important, you know, in, in any context. And, um, and here especially, um, it's important to be skeptical. I can't possibly believe that everything everybody sees is an alien spacecraft. I don't believe that, um, so I'm skeptical of that, but I'm also skeptical of the people who say that it can't possibly be an alien spacecraft because I don't think that's true either. Um, you don't you don't ever assign a probability of zero or one to anything. Um, that ensures you can't learn. Um, there's a theorem called Bayes' theorem. You put, throw a one or a zero in there, and learning stops. So. Um, that's assuming you know everything or know what's true and you, we don't know the truth so we have to be skeptical i've got yeah. song lyrics tattooed on my arm which is all we know is that we don't know and i think that's a good way to kind of live life and apply a lot of things um although uh, one of your quotes here is uh, and i love this unknown engineering can look a lot like anomalous physics um and i wonder kevin what is the probability that our greatest scientists our greatest engineers have managed to devise this type of technology if we look at modern day we look at tic tacs we look at the gimbal footage you know go fast what is the chance and this is i suppose at, from a skeptic's point of view, that Lockheed Martin or whoever it may be have managed to develop technology that we're talking about now? That's a good question, and it's not clear. Um, I think, uh, unfortunately, those those videos which were very influential and important, um, they they're not spectacular. They, in fact, are are given what the pilots have reported. Those videos are showing the most boring aspects of these encounters that, that yeah. happen. So, which is unfortunate. I would like to see some of the more exciting, you know, see videos of some of the more exciting encounters. Um, that would be helpful. It is possible that somebody engineered something and is testing something. I mean, that you can't rule that out. Um, and that's one of the problems ab about saying that, you know, these things are extraterrestrial. In fact, we have moved away from that in some ways, especially Congress has, which, you know, to their credit, um, they use the term non-human intelligence, NHI. And, and this was used a good bit at Seoul as well, um, because proving something extraterrestrial is really hard. Um, you're going to have to prove it came from another planet. Um, that's not clear how to do that. It's not clear how one would go about doing that. Um, and, 
and the fact that we've seen, you know, we know it, we know that UFOs are related to water. Um, there's some suspicion that what if what if they're living underwater? What they're 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 not coming from. In fact, Carl Sagan used this as an argument uh, decades ago. He said, "I have a hard time believing that somebody." is arriving from interstellar space every week, which, yeah, exactly. That's a big, that's a big problem. And in fact, I wish I could have a conversation with him because I'd grab him by the head and say, Carl, you're almost there. One more logical step and you've got it because they're not arriving here every week. They live here. That's the, that's the conclusion. Their reaction time to problems um, like the uh, Fukushima um Nuclear disaster after the tsunami, um, which is in episode four of Encounters, and pitched this show twice now. Um, <laughs> but but they that they arrived the next day. There were UFOs there the next day. So how far away are they coming from? Well, that puts a half day light year, a half light day radius around the Earth because it would take half a day for a light to get there. Information about the nuclear disaster would have to travel out and then somebody would have to travel back at the speed of light to get here on time. So they're coming from at least within the solar system and uh, probably earth. So they probably live here. So are they extraterrestrial? We don't actually know. Um, could they have evolved here? Like um, they're just another living earth thing that we didn't learn about yet. Very possible. Our oceans are very, very poorly explored. We know very little about our oceans. We know more about the surface of Mars than we know about our oceans. Um, and so there's a lot that we don't know. And um, and then going back to the original question, you know, could a company have um, come up with some of these things and be testing them? Yeah, that's possible. Um, it would be surprising for them to be doing that in a um, naval training area because that would be highly illegal and dangerous, and um, and they could stand to lose valuable equipment that way. So that's hard to believe, but um, but you can't rule it out. It's interesting you say about the the next step of this conversation for Carl, Sa Carl Sagan was being realizing they're closer, they're, they're not coming from that far away. And I try and have that conversation with people in everyday life, people I work with in the office, uh, and they'll ask, you know, you, UFO podcast you've got, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, and have a little chat with them. Very quickly, I come away from, what if they're not coming from that far away? And that gets them on the back foot and gets them listening at least. And as soon as you mention, maybe they're coming from here and underwater, so many folks check out the conversation and struggle to have that have that chat. And I wonder, and, and some of the data you discussed in your presentation, which is relatively well known now, is that the radar data that Kevin Day reported was these objects, the Tic Tacs, came from a ceiling of around 28,000 feet to just on sea level in less than a second, not 0.78 seconds. Now, your formula shows to, uh, to a layman like me that that would have equated the energy required would have been around 10 times the nuclear output of the entire United States for that sort of movement and speed to be generated. And I wonder, why is data like that being ignored or completely overlooked by the, the public and the mainstream media? Is that because pictures and videos as, as boring or prosaic as they may look is more appealing than, than hearing data like that from a scientist? That's a good question as to why it's being ignored. Um, I don't really know. It's not being ignored by everybody. In fact, a number of scientists that are studying UFOs now or are interested in doing so were compelled by that data in that paper. So um, these are – these are and, and, and um, uh, at one point there was an editorial accusing them of being simple calculations, right, is a derogatory thing. Um, however, the simple calculations are the compelling ones. It's the complex calculations that are the ones that you worry about as being right. Um, the simple ones could have been done by anybody, and I'll, and I'll repeat, should have been done by any of the physicists who have been, ever been introduced to these problems. It's the first thing you do when you encounter a problem like this. You, you hear that this thing dropped from 28,000 feet to sea level in 0.78 seconds. You grab a piece of paper and you write down – you, you scribble out those equations and a professional physicist can do that in 30 seconds. Um, they should have their answer. And um, why, why doesn't um, 
you know, our popular, our physics, pop, science popularizers do this? Why don't they do this? I don't know. Um, they're not, they are really not interested. Um, and I think they have investment in not being interested at this point. Um, why didn't Sean Kirkpatrick do this? Um, I don't know. Sean Kirkpatrick knew about that paper too. And, um, and he denied its existence to Senator Gillibrand later, a month later. So it's, um, I don't know exactly what's going on. There is a atmosphere of denial here where people, I'm starting to believe that some people are scared by this and don't want it to be true. And that worries them. Um, it's going to change their worldview. It's going to create all sorts of problems that they're not prepared for. And I think that that's part of what's going on. But these are easy calculations to do, and um, and we do have data for a lot of them. And um, and actually, I'm going back through trying to collect more cases where you can estimate speeds and accelerations. I stumbled on one the other day where a um, where a physicist had calculated the acceleration of something that a marine um, took a photos of and wrote in a letter that this acceleration is insanely high. Um, that never got published anywhere, but I stumbled on this letter then, then, so I'm going to work and publish these things because there's, this has been known by some for a long time. I mean, Herman, Herman Oberth, I mentioned this in my soul talk, Herman Oberth, who was mentor of Werner von Braun. So he's a rocketry pioneer had given a talk in 1954 on UFOs and discuss the fact that they had been measured traveling at speeds of 19 kilometers a second. So quick, those of you listening, go to Google, figure out how fast it is. That's around 40,000 miles an hour. Um, so Herman Oberth knew this and reported this from over 50 radar observations, he says in his talk, say that these things can travel at 40,000 miles an hour. Um, that's spacecraft speed. The space station and the space shuttle only goes about 17,000 miles an hour. Um, so the New Horizons probe to Pluto is traveling about 45,000 miles an hour. So we know that these things are traveling at spacecraft speeds. And that's been well known for a long time by some. And it continues to be ignored by others, which is why I joke in my talk why... Um, Oberth looks so grumpy because nobody's listening to him, even after, you know, 60 years or 70 years. Yeah, I did like that. You got a laugh from a, a very tough audience, I'm sure it would have been if uh, those things yeah. were to fall flat there. Well, as well, he really does look grumpy. I mean, <laughs> it really struck me that, and he should be grumpy. I mean, that's that's really upsetting. I mean, he told people this in 1954. We should have been on top of this in 1954. And we're, we, have, we still are not on top of it. And a lot of that is thanks to Arrow now. Arrow now is still trying to claim there's nothing to see here. There's been nothing to see here. Why wasn't Homer, Herman Oberth discussed in the, the report? That's historical. He was a scientist. Um, he, his assessment should have been discussed. It wasn't. Um, there's big problems here. Let me ask then, you mentioned earlier uh, your point, your second point when I asked you the two things that intrigue you. You mentioned the strangeness, the paranormal, whether it's the hitchhiker effect, Havana syndrome comes into that, no doubt, and all the other weird and wonderful events that can follow someone, poltergeist activity after a sighting or experience um, as an aspect of this phenomenon, which isn't widely investigated because it's hard to do that. And I wonder, if there's multiple different phenomena all at play here when it comes to UFOs and UAPs, do you think we're studying this the right way? And if not, do you think there's a better strategy to go after investigating and studying the UAP phenomenon? That's a good question. And I think that this is studies of UAPs are, are going to have to evolve. Um, I think at the moment we are still stuck in the, stage where you have to prove that they're, they are real and prove they're interesting or anomalous. And this is where, this is a stage of science where science looks very much like pseudoscience. Um, pseudoscience is the, is, I mean, in science, you basically disprove hypotheses. Um, 
And pseudoscience is typically characterized by trying to prove one hypothesis, focused on that hypothesis and trying to try it, trying to prove it. Now, the problem is that science kind of sets things up so that if there's a new phenomenon, um, nobody's going to believe it's real unless you prove it's real. So you have to first prove that this phenomenon is real. Um, but now you're trying to prove a hypothesis which makes it look like pseudoscience. So how do you get out of this cycle? I mean, you're almost you're almost set up. The system's almost set up for failure. Um, it's set up so you can't discover anything new, um, and that's really a logical problem with science. Um, once you get past that and actually start studying characteristics of the phenomenon, then then you now you can start ruling out hypotheses and acting like science. So so the trick is. To make any progress here, you have to you have to give up trying to prove that they're real. Give up trying to prove that it's anomalous. Um, instead, characterize them. Do what you know what some people and um, what some scientists call biology stamp collecting. Characterize everything, right? <laughs> and that's mm. an old there's an old quote I think from Rutherford or something like that. Um, so just try to characterize them and. Um, and collect collect information, and then try to um, try to see what you can learn from that. And what we found is the easiest thing to characterize at this point are their um, speeds and accelerations. That's the easiest thing to measure, and um, and those speeds and accelerations are really anomalous, and that you can um, that you can demonstrate. Uh, so I think that's the right now is the best way to attack the problem. Um, and then try to figure out what they are. How how are this? How are you traveling at forty thousand miles through the atmosphere without a sonic boom or a fireball? I don't know how that works. I don't know how you can do that. But now, now that's something you could study to try to understand. Um, so I think that's how the way you, you have to begin. You have to base, break through in steps. And you know, once we've established, you know to some degree what these things are like, you know, we can start studying more, you know, detailed aspects of them. Uh, but I wonder, Kevin, how do you do that in a very, a very sceptical modern society where 50% of people say black, 50% say white? Um, and I don't mean in skin colour, God, by any means before I get cancelled, but I just mean in terms of any argument, it's so polarised on different sides, especially if you look at social media. And I, I even wonder if uh, a body was wheeled out, and I liked your use of, you know, let's forget the White House lawn, let's say Central Park. If they wheeled out a body at a press conference in Central Park and said, here's an alien body, 50% of people would believe that was real. 50% of people would say it's a false flag disinformation psyop campaign. It seems very difficult now to do that. So even if you can prove here's an object going 40,000 miles an hour, half the folks will say, wow, that's non-human. Half the folks are going to say that's just Boeing, British Airways, Lockheed Martin testing top secret technology. Does it just become very difficult nowadays to do that? Right. So, 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 if that's the case, I mean, you've got the, I mean, the 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 main argument against, so, you know, so some people are going to look at that and say, well, clearly it's that's non-human technology. Fine. Okay. Um, if you believe that, that's okay. Um, other people are going to say that's Boeing or Lockheed Martin or somebody. Um, they probably would actually say that the data clearly has to be wrong. So now you've got to work on demonstrating that the data isn't wrong. So you've got to use multiple instruments. You can collect your own data. You do it carefully, make sure things are calibrated, um, which means you can't rely on military videos. Um, you don't know that these things are well calibrated. You don't know that the person who's using them are they're not, they're not using them in an experimental context. They're using them in a totally different situation. Um, it's, it's more, di that's difficult. So you'd have to attack that problem. You're going to have to attack the showing that the data is real um, and the data is accurate and precise. And, um, and that's why we're trying to collect our own data now. So we at UAPX, the people at, um, in other, on other projects are also trying to collect their own data. And that's 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 how you'll make progress eventually. Eventually, you will collect data where people will look at it and say, "Well, yeah, okay, now this is interesting." And you know, and if somebody still says, "Well, it's Boeing and Lockheed Martin," the answer is, "Well, what are they doing? Try to figure out what they're doing. How does it work? Let's figure out what Lockheed Martin's up to." 
Um, that's fine. I don't have any problems with that because um, maybe we'll get at the truth. Maybe they are doing something. Um, and if it's not them, you should be able to rule that up um, with more data. You mentioned, but it's a long game. Talking. I mean, this is this yeah. is the long game, and it's not. We're not going to get answers. And and you're right. Things are so polarized. Things are. I mean, things are so. It's difficult because if you had. If the Pentagon came out later this afternoon and said, yeah, there are aliens, we have alien bodies, we have spaceships, here's a photo, I'm, I'm not sure I would believe it. You know, I, I want, let's see the evidence, let's see all the evidence. And um, so, yeah, you're right. I'm not sure, I'm not sure I would believe it if they came out and said if it's real. Um, and I don't believe it when, they, when they're coming on saying that it's all nonsense. I don't believe that either. Um, I think these are, the, these the, are the same guys. Remember, these are the same guys who said Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons of mass destruction. I mean, come on, we can't. And and they had and they have had stories for Roswell. Their story for Roswell has changed like five times over the last eighty years. I mean, one of their one of their explanations of Roswell was that they were testing a Mars lander, a saucer shaped Mars lander. Who's testing a Mars lander in 1947, 10 years before we knew we could have satellites? Really? That's your explanation? That's what the Air Force said in the 90s. Um, and then they said they were dropping dummies. Well, why are you? Why? The question is, why do you feel you need to explain something that's saucer shaped and has dummies? Um, mm. What actually happened in Roswell? Why don't you tell us what data you collected instead of giving us explanations? Um, ridiculous explanations. And I always say that the first explanation that came out of the Army Air Force was that they captured a disc. And that story got quashed the next day and it got replaced with all sorts of ridiculous stories since. So what do you believe? You believe the first story is what you believe. The first one's probably the true one. Um, but that's just me. I mean, that's how I would handle it. But oh, yeah, yeah you can't, I can't trust these. You can't trust these guys. Until they produce information, you know, and, and you know, Kirkpatrick and Arrow has said that, you know, that's all nonsense. Well, if Roswell's nonsense, let's see some of the documentation. There were troops there. Where are the requisitions for these troops? What are their orders? Why aren't, why didn't you re release those? Um, General Ramey, when photographed with the material that was just balsa wood and aluminum foil, um, that was supposed to be, they, they claimed they were, that was from the object they collected um, and the, um, and the, you know, person who collected him said it was not the same as material. Um, but he, Ramey is clearly holding a top secret memo. Let's see the top secret memo. What does that top secret memo say? Release that. Let's see it. Um, there was a C-45 transport plane that they took of this material that they collected, you know, back to Fort Worth, Texas. Um, where's the requisition for that plane? What are the orders for that plane? Let's see that. You know, re re release some of this information. You know, release the documents. Um, but no, they don't release any documents. They just say, oh, it was Project Mogul. Now, now that's the story. It was Project Mogul, although according to the um, professor at NYU who ran Project Mogul, he says they didn't launch a balloon in June. So there were no balloons up. Um, and if they had, it would have been illegal. So they would have broken the law. Um, so how was it Project Mogul? Um, that's a good question. And, you, and, you, and Project Mogul, what was that? Project Mogul, it's the current excuse for what Roswell was. They were trying to figure out how to get a balloon to hover at 50,000 feet with a radio transponder that can detect um, electromagnetic signals from nuclear blasts from Russia, from nuclear testing. They wanted to hover this at 50,000 feet because that was the optimal altitude to be able to pick up, pick up these signals. And um, the problem was it was hard to get a balloon to hover at 50,000 feet because rubber balloons typically go up and as they go up, they expand because the air pressure is less and that makes them go up higher, they expand more, they go up higher, they expand more until they pop and they fall. And that's typically what happens. So the, the whole Project Mogul was, design, was, was about trying to figure out how to keep a balloon hovering it for 50,000 feet. And that's what that project was for. And um, 
So why is why was that so top secret now still that they can't release any of that information? Um, it's a technology about getting a balloon to hover. That doesn't sound that hard to me anymore. And um, and if the balloon would have been released in early June and was recovered, having crashed in late June, beginning of July. Um, that means that you've got a balloon hovering over Roswell, New Mexico for 30 days, um, or at least three weeks. Really, it's not going to get caught up by the jet stream and go somewhere else. It just hovered over New Mexico, that area of New Mexico, that county, for 30 days. That's hard to believe. And it's hard to believe they didn't know anything was there. Um, they're supposedly got a radar reflector on this thing so they can track it, um, yet... The Air Force didn't know that it had crash landed and um, nobody tried to retrieve it until Mac Brazel found it on his ranch. So what were these guys actually doing? Um, they weren't doing a good job of tracking their balloon. So I've got a lot of questions about Project Mogul if they're going to use that as the excuse. And um, But what I want to see from Arrow is the evidence. What's the evidence that it was Project Mogul? I'm skeptical and I want to see the evidence. Skepticism works both ways, my friend, and um, I'm sorry. I don't think it was Project Mogul. I think something extraordinary happened. I don't know what it was. I would like to see the evidence, though. No, I appreciate that, and you, you gave a lot of good arguments for that as well. I've always been on the side that Roswell was definitely something non-human. We'll go with that. Um, something something happened. I mean, they, they had... Um, they had the rancher was detained for five days and questioned and threatened. You're going to question and threaten somebody about balloons with a radio transponder? Really? And if the military is going to do that, I think somebody has to answer to that. Um, that shouldn't be legal. I think one of the something issues else Congress should look into <laughs> as if they don't have enough to do already. No, no. And one of the issues, Kevin, with the UFO topic, and you'll appreciate as a scientist, is many of the and almost exclusively all incidents and events, experiences, abductions are reactive. They are happening before you know it and you're in the middle of it or you're seeing it like with your incident. Uh, you mentioned during your talk, one of your colleagues at UAPX, Matthew Zagedis, was inventing a handheld nuclear reactor, essentially, with the, the plan to essentially what bait and bring these UAP or UFOs. That's, that's, that the was open. the inspiration for his invention, at least. I don't know if we'll actually use it for that, but <laughs> but that was the well, idea. Well, that that's something that's been talked about, isn't it? Using nuclear reactors or nuclear fuel. To, to debate these things, they seem drawn to them. Was there any update on that? Because the talk was back in November. And I just wonder, how, how exactly do you think or would you foresee that working? Well, I think the, the update is that his reactor works. I've seen it. It seems to be working. They've tested it. Um, you get fission. The thing fizzes. It's not... Um, it, it, you get nuclear fission, apparently... Um, it looks like it's successful, and he's continuing to test it. Um, but now, because it's more public, we can't. I mean, nobody should be carting around a nuclear reactor trying to <laughs> trying to <laughs> lure in UFOs. I mean, there should be some legal. Um, there should be some oversight here. So I, I think I don't think that we're not going to, I don't think we're going to be able to bait them in with his nuclear reactor, but his nuclear reactor is now a reality and they're testing it and, and which is fantastic. So. I think the Ghostbusters got in, for, into trouble for something very similar for running about. With yeah. I don't want to get, in, I don't want to go head to head with the, the, the red haired guy. Who, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that, yeah, that's cats and dogs sleeping together. I don't need, we don't need that. But I, I'm I'm guessing, and this goes into probably my last question on the talk itself, is you finish talking about, like you say, the oceans and how other planetary other planetary bodies' oceans are somewhere we should also also be looking at. I think many are now in a place where speculating that advanced life life forms could either be based in or living in our oceans. Again, what does that look like for you? And this is speculation I appreciate. Do you think we have empty drones that have been left behind or put here by something else or do you think we have full-fledged and i hate to say the word alien but alien bases with these things or, or living craft. beings yeah yeah i wonder how do you compute that it's a good question i don't 
some of these appear to be, you know, autonomous um, drones, perhaps, um, but it's not clear. I don't think we have answers yet, and that's something I'd certainly like to know. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think we have answers to this, um, but it's going to require a lot more investigation. It's going to require some monitoring of our oceans which is difficult to do. Uh, most satellite companies don't monitor our oceans, so we aren't collecting imagery over the oceans, which has been a problem for ships that have gone missing and people trying to get satellite data on the miss missing ships. Um, that's always been, that's been a problem the last few years. Um, so there's reasons for doing it, but not, I think not enough ships go missing that you worry about doing it all the time. The oceans cover 75% of the surface of the planet. I mean, this is a water planet. It's not, it's the, I, I always joke, you know, after Uranus, this is probably the worst named planet in our solar system. Um, we called it Earth. It's water. The planet should be called water or ocean. Um, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a water planet. And um, I don't think we really, you know, as land dwelling creatures, I don't think we have a good appreciation for that yet. Um, you know, there are a few, a few people who do. Um, Admiral Gallaudet does for sure, but um, but most of us don't. If I was to give you and Admiral Gallaudet uh, a budget of, you know, $50 million tomorrow and I said to you, is there any particular area of interest in the ocean? Is there anywhere you would go first? Well, there are hotspots. There are places where people have seen UFOs related to water. And um, when we went to when UAPX went to Catalina Island um, to look to monitor the Catalina Channel, that's one of the places. That's where the um, 2004 Nimitz encounters would start. The UAPs would appear on Kevin Day's radar at about 80,000 feet um, around the southern area of uh, Catalina Island. So that's one place. Um, northern Puerto Rico is another place where there are, are sightings. Um, off the coast of Wales is another place um, that I mentioned in the TV or that's discussed in the TV show. Um, there's places in Australia. Um, I'm going to be going uh, to Long Island later this week to basically monitor the coast to watch for UAPs myself. So, um, so we're going to collect data there um, as well. So there are, there are places to look and, um, and setting up permanent observation stations would probably be a smart thing to do, especially in the places where these things have been seen. Um, and then the second thing I would do is try to come up with ways to better monitor underwater. You know, are there ways we can watch underwater? Our, our only real access underwater is sonar, which is um, not ideal. So it's hard to know exactly what to do. Well, that's fair. Um, Kevin, I want to move into listener questions. Like I say, we have had a lot sent in to the podcast. I had to do a lot of culling here. So apologies if you don't hear your question. Uh, we'll get through as many of them as we can. They'll jump all over the place. But um, Kevin's been very generous with his time to, to get through these. So um, Kevin, first up, question from Newman. Newman says, at the 2021 conference of the AIAA, Kevin presented MWIR, LWIR footage of a mysterious tray foil shaped craft seemingly shadowing a jet plane as recorded by UAPX engineer David Mason. What is UAPX current state of analysis and conclusions on the footage? Yes, that was recorded by David Mason from his backyard. Um, and it was a, an unknown object, trefoil shaped, um, that was shadowing a, um, a jet airliner that was coming into land at, um, at the Seattle airport. So um, we don't, we haven't done any, we're not really in a position to do more analysis on that. The, um, the problem is you have a, um, it was recorded on two FLIR cameras. We have the um, temperature from the infrared. So this thing is about 60 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, whereas the airplane was hot um, or much warmer, like in the 30s Fahrenheit. Um, so, so it's a strange object because, and it wasn't um, visibly, 
it was invisible, invisible light. So, um, so that we also know, but it was recorded on two cameras. The, he was, David Mason was just testing his equipment at the time, seeing what he could pick up. And um, he had two cameras operating some distance from each other, but their precise locations relative to one another aren't known. So we can't use it for triangulation um, to get a size or, or height. Um, if that thing was about the same altitude as the jet airplane, then it's about the same size of the jet airplane, which is a little shocking. Um, but this is another aspect of UAPs that um, is real, is that they often shadow airplanes. And they'll shadow jet passenger jets. Um, the one seen off the coast uh, between Los Angeles and Hawaii, um, one of the pilots noted that these objects had followed him for about 40 minutes um, on a trip from Los Angeles to, to Hawaii. So this, this is very common. Um, sometimes the pilots notice them and um, it, yeah, it puts, it unnerves them because they don't know what they are. This is one of the reasons for studying this. This is probably in my mind, probably the main reason, the best argument for studying these things is that these things are encountered by pilots. Um, they're encountered by airline pilots who are responsible for the lives of 250 people in the back. Um, they're encountered by um, Air Force and Navy pilots in in battle, in wartime situations. Um, they encountered them from the USS Roosevelt when they were doing bombing runs in 2015 in Syria. They would have to fly past UAPs and encounter UAPs, and then they'd have to go on their bombing run, which is why the Navy was so worried about this. This is really how it started. Um, so these things are an air travel hazard and pilots need to know what's in the air. Um, that's a necessity. And if there are things that we don't know about that are in the air, we need to know what they are so the pilots can be educated so that they know what they're encountering. I, I don't want to be on a passenger jet and then have the pilot discover that we're being shadowed and then have something happen where the pilot decides he has to take some evasive maneuver. I don't want that mm. situation. I'm sure you don't either. I fly a lot. Um, that should not be happening. And we should make sure, you know, air safety is all about preventing possible accidents. So let's study these things and find out what they are. Instead of saying, oh, I'm sure it's all nothing. Well, it's not all nothing. It's something. It's something that's bothering pilots. Let's f solve it from that perspective, which is why I think what the AIAA is doing is exactly right. Um, another but, question. But to, answer your, to answer your question, to quick answer the question, sorry, because you've got a lot of them. Um, That's okay. Yeah, we, we haven't been able to do more analysis on that video because we couldn't do any triangulation. We just have the unknown object that to me looks like a Klingon D5 warship and, uh, <laughs> and, a, and a passenger jet. So... No, I appreciate that. Um, question, uh, another one from Newman. Newman asked, is Kevin aware and has by chance any thoughts on the recently put online preprint by a collaboration of researchers who suggest there might be a shadow biosphere, excuse me, a shadow biosphere of proto-life forms existing in the form of plasmas in Earth's outer atmosphere? How interesting. Is this by, um, maybe the was this by Ron... Ron Josephs or something? I'm not sure. I've, I've, um, I'm not sure what to think of this. Yes, um, it is. I, yeah, that is. Yes, I've just I've got it up now. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not sure what to think of this. The they're suggesting something rather radical that uh, plasmas can be alive, right? Um, and I think that we probably don't. You know, we've studied one kind of life uh, here on Earth as well we're familiar with. And so we're extremely biased in, in thinking about what life is like. And, and when I was at NASA and continuing, still there are constantly conferences on trying to figure out how are we going to identify life when we encounter it. Uh, we don't know how to do that. You can't, you can't do it with a tricorder. Um, there's no such thing. And there's no thing to test for life. Um, so... It's hard to know. And and um, can plasmas be alive? I mean, could you have living plasmas on the surface of the sun? I, I can't answer that. I would have no idea. Um, I don't know how it would work, but um, 
but that's my ignorance. So, so that, that's what these guys are suggesting that there is another other forms of life here that we're not aware of yet, um, very possibly. And um, you're going to need some evidence to convince people. And it's going to be hard to do, but go for it. I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> I think it's good to good to study things. That's what we do. That's what a scientist ought to do, study things. There's a few more questions from Newman and the Patreon exclusive section, or sorry, not just Patreon, but the, the paid section that's a, a 10 minute exclusive at the end, folks. Um, so if you're on any of those platforms, you'll hear a little bit more from Newman and a few others. But we'll carry on now. Um, Kevin, Purple Rain, who is over in Vienna, asked via YouTube and he wanted to say, I love what Dr. Knuth is doing and enjoyed his talk at Saul. But I watched it with my very scientific minded son and immediately he had three questions. Um, so I think you've got a bit of a skeptic here from a scientific point of view um, right. watching it along. Um, so the first question was, um, Dr. Knuth talks about presumptions in the intro, but why didn't he list the presumptions he had to make for the calculations? I didn't quite understand the question. Can you say that again? So I'll read it, but I don't fully get it. So hopefully this makes sense to you. Um, okay. Dr. Knuth talks about presumptions in the intro, but why didn't he list the presumptions he had to make for the calculations? Does that make sense? Oh, he talks about the presumptions and the what? What was that other word that you and used? Your, and your, your intro and the introduction to the talk. You oh, talk and about the intros. Presumptions. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to figure out where I didn't make, didn't list the, pre I didn't list them. I probably stated them. I hope I did. Um, I mean, there's the, the, for the, you know, the tic-tac dropping, the presumptions there are that, yeah, that's a real physical object that's actually performing the maneuver. That's a presumption mm -hmm. um, that the objects were at about 28,000 feet. What I didn't describe there was that I considered there to be about a 10% error. So there's actually a distribution of, of positions ranging around 300 feet around the 28,000 feet when I do the calculation, which is why there's kind of a histogrammed result of the ex resulting accelerations. And, um, and I put in about a 10% error for the amount of time it took for it to fall as well. I figured a 10% error is, I don't know what kinds of errors their, their, their SPY-1 radar system has. Um, that's going to be classified. I'm not going to be able to know that. So I used 10% thinking that 10 to 15% is basically what our lab, our students do in labs. So I'm going to hope that the Navy can at least do as well as our students do in labs, give them 10%. And so that was where that came from. Um, but yeah, that wasn't explicitly stated. So um, why, why I didn't list them in the talk is because I had, what, 25 minutes to speak and I've got a yeah, lot of ground yeah. to cover and I can go into all of the presumptions I make, um, which I would put in a scientific paper, you know, writing a scientific paper there, there. But um, I don't have time to discuss all of that um, in the talk. Plus, it's boring. Nobody wants to hear all that anyway. Um, so those are reasons to not do it in a presentation but that's basically why uh, and here's another question again from the same listener or viewers uh, son who's scientifically minded we've got a skeptic here which i think is very fair that's um, good keep why, going yeah yeah so hopefully again this makes sense to you why did dr knuth use a comparison of the energy the ufo had needed that did not state a unit he said something like the energy amount can be compared to the nuclear output of the us but did not state per hour per day per year i guess the point is when scientists go public with this topic the bar for non-believers is very high and they have to meet that in order to also convince them ah right okay well i did state the amount of power that was one what is it um what was it? It was 1100 terawatts. I think I, I listed on the graph. So that's the amount of power output that would have been required for the UAP. Um, I didn't list the, you're right. I did not list the amount of nuclear power output for the United States, but it's more than 10, but one, one, one 1.1 terawatts is much more than, um, much more than the nuclear power output of the United States. Yeah, I didn't list that in the scientific paper. I did list the nuclear power output of the 
the Palo Verde nuclear generating station in Arizona, which is the biggest one we have, and that is listed. Um, why did I not save the period of time? Because power is the amount of energy per time. And so that is how much energy you're putting out per, per second. Um, and so that I don't need to tell you how long. If you want to know how much energy it was, then I would have to tell you how many joules were expended. And then the um, then I'd have to compare that with the amount of time for the nuclear power output of the U.S. But that's why I didn't list that, because power is energy per time. No. Purple Rain does say thank you for all the work you're doing, warmest regards from Vienna. And hopefully if your son has a real interest, uh, maybe we can convert another skeptic if he goes and checks out the, the scientific papers himself. Yeah, um, go read go read the read the papers and um and then if you have questions, you can find me on at the university university at Albany website. My university email is there. Email me questions. That's perfectly fine. I'm happy to answer them. Awesome. Um, a question from Pugix. Why is Dr. Knuth dismissive of the psychic or mental aspect of the UFO phenomenon? I'm not dismissive of it. I don't know how to study it. I don't understand it. And, um, and I would have a hard time f focusing on that and then trying to make headway with uh, fellow scientists. So, this is a, a lot of this is about, you know, how do we actually go about studying these things? A lot of this is strategic in studying them in ways that you can get other people interested rather than alienating yourself. Um, yeah, I could go off and try to study alien abductees and their, you know, what they say about aliens being tele telepathic, but I, I wouldn't have any friends. So, <laughs> and so it would, that would be hard. Um, and I'm not sure what to think about that. That's difficult. And then how do you study that? How do you actually study it? How do you handle it? I, I'm not there when they're being abducted. I can't hook them up with EEG equipment and wait for them to be abducted. Um, there's no obvious way to study it. Uh, I don't know how to do so. So I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm a physicist, so I'm going to study physics things. And that's the that's the that's my current plan of attack. Um, see what if I can make headway into the physics of the objects that people are seeing rather than uh, the other weird aspects. Um, I'm not dismissive of them. I, I find them fascinating and weird, and I don't know what to think about them. But, um, but I think that studying them is a whole different ball of wax. Well, here's a physics question for you from Kenneth Noisewater. Nice anchor man. Right, I can maybe there. handle that. <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed. So uh, my question in terms of physics, the highest Mach we have achieved or reached as humans on a manned aircraft, I believe is 9.6 Mach or hypersonic. What is the rumoured recorded or otherwise speed of a UAP that hasn't been explained by Chinese high hypersonic drones? The highest um, speeds that I know of for UAPs are, well, about Mach 60. Although, um, what is the, although Daniel Kumbe had estimated um, the speeds of the JAL Airlines um, UFO that followed that, that airlines for 40 minutes in 1986 to be, um, about 250,000 miles an hour, which I'm right now quick calculating into um, mock speed because I can't do that in my head easily. So, yeah, so that's something like Mach 325. So, so, so Daniel Kumpe from the Niels Bohr Institute had put in his book Anomalous his calculations from the radar data from the JAL-1628 case. When I, when I wrote about that in the paper, I just wrote, I put in estimates based on the summary of what the UFO was doing, not the actual radar data. And I state that in the paper, but he used the radar data and he found them to this large walnut shaped craft, which was about 37747s in length estimated by the pilot to be accelerating at about 10,000 Gs and having a maximum speed of about 250,000 miles an hour. 
uh, which is about Mach 325, which is a quick calculator there because I'm on a computer. So um, I'm not doing this in my head. I'm not that good. And um, <clears throat> and so and keep in mind that 250,000 miles an hour, you can get to the moon in about 50 minutes. Mm. It's a 50-minute trip to the moon. You can go to the moon for lunch and come back in time um, if you had a craft like that. I want something like that. That would be great. Like I said earlier, I always wanted to go to the moon. I want to get a, I'll get a ride on one of these things. That would be fantastic. I like to try and put things in perspective so I understand them. And Top Gun 2, for those who have seen it, uh, Tom Cruise at the beginning has a like a experimental jet that he manages to push to 10.2, Mach 10.2, which is roughly 7,800 miles per hour. So then you're saying this thing potentially was going Mach 325. That's a slow UAP, 7,000 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not the slowest because the Nimitz case, what was strange about that initially is what they were tracking south at about 100, 100 knots. It's about 120 miles an hour at, at 28,000 feet. So that's that's a slow UAP. But, yeah. Uh, question from Stingray, because I've still got loads to get through. Uh, what is Kevin currently obsessed with? <laughs> UAPs. <laughs> too, my, too much my family's disappointment. <laughs> UAPs and uh, all the weird stuff associated with them. Yeah. How can um, you not Matt. be? This is really this is really interesting stuff. I mean, usually when I when I went into physics as a grad student, I worried about what I would study. I thought, oh, I I would like to study, you know, gravity and relativity, but Einstein solved all that. So I don't even know what to do. I, I mean, what is there to study anymore? Well, there's this. This is a real mystery. I mean, how often do you get to encounter a real mystery? Uh, this is fun. That's, that's what I'm obsessed with. I can't disagree. Uh, Max over in Patreon asked, given unlimited funding, what would be your wish list for publicly available sensor systems to generate UFO data? My wish list? Oh, my God. Uh, I'd want it all. I'd want... Infrared cameras, ultraviolet cameras, regular visible cameras with different filters running at different um, different exposure times, with polarizers, with um, all sorts of things. Um, I want to detect electric and magnetic fields. I want to detect gravitational fields. I want particle detectors like our cosmic watch. I want them directional so I can aim them at things. Um, yeah, that would be a big wish list. I have a wish list. I have it written down. And um, and if somebody has, you know, $20,000 they want to throw my way, I can fulfill a lot of that wish list, which would be great. Brandon Fugel, Bob Bigelow, any of those listening or catching up on this, then throw throw some Yeah, you can donate to UAPX. Yeah. We're a nonprofit. Um, yeah. Or donate to our university, too. But you'd have to notify me first. Otherwise, they'll just take it and not give it to me. <laughs> Uh, no, that's fair enough. A uh, question from Jeremy. Jeremy asks, do you think any of the UAP we have seen over the course of history may be biological in nature, for example, or i.e. alive? That's a good question, too. I don't know. Um, UAP are, as I, as I say in the Soul Talk, they're a class of phenomena. We don't know what we're dealing with, so they are not all the same things, Um and so I, I, I don't have an answer to that. And then some of them, you know, could be could be artificial biology, right? They could have been made by somebody else that are then now their own life forms. We don't really have a clue as to what kind of diversity of life we're, we're dealing with in the universe here. Right, I think there's a lot of surprises out there. I think we're going to be a lot of surprises and discoveries on the horizon. And I think that this is a great place to look. I hope so. Uh, questions from CS that have just been answered recently and in in what Kevin's been saying, so thanks for sending those in. Mikey asks, theorizing using available technology in the public domain, is it possible to create a craft that can act like the Tic Tac or at least partly emulate its propulsion and movement, i.e. utilizing a nuclear power generator, waveguide, with recent metamaterial breakthroughs? Do you think this is possible? No, I wouldn't know how to do it. Um... Yeah, there are some hypothesized methods using 
Um, meta materials are kind of like this magic, you know, box that we throw these things into. Meta materials would have to have certain properties, and we don't know how to make these things yet. So, um, we I don't think it's possible. I don't think we know how to do this yet. There are people with ideas. We're trying trying new things, but um, I don't think we're quite there. Uh, speaking of new things, Peter Earnshaw, who'd like to send in a question or two. Peter asks, do you believe that new physics such as anti-gravity and zero-point energy has been discovered, explored and suppressed by US military spooks and their contractors? If so, for how long and what sort of discoveries? I can't say. I would love to know, but I, I can't say that that's been done. Here's here's one from Peter about uh, Ted in the Sky, which is the documentary that UAPX was featured in. Um, how confident are you that the evidence you gathered showed a wormhole in the clouds versus gamma ray uh, gamma radiation burst caused by electrical discharges due to normal weather and cloud movement and friction? Well, we can't be confident there's a wormhole, um, mainly because we don't know what a wormhole would look like. So with, since you don't know what one would actually look like, we can't say that what we saw was a wormhole. So I think that's probably the best way to handle that part. I, I know that's a disappointing answer, but that's the situation. Um, the little white dots that we see inside that hole in the clouds, those appear to be real objects. To me, they look like real objects. They, um, I suspect that it's possible it's possible that there are real objects that went up and went through the clouds and actually caused a false streak hole and that's what we're we're filming there but um sadly our FLIR cameras had been accidentally unplugged earlier in the evening and their batteries had run out about a half hour before that happened so we only have that short video from the ufo ufo dap system it's a situation that me and Matthew are every few weeks will kick ourselves over again and again because that should not have happened. And um, nothing we can do about it. We missed it. We only collected a little bit of data. We got that um, large energy spike on the cosmic watch, uh, which is anomalous and seems to be time associated with that event. Um but we don't know what we don't know what happened there. It's interesting, whatever it is. Um, we have tried to get footage from other cameras in the area. We've talked to other universities that were studying pollution to see if they had equipment up at the time. We have tried to collect infrasound. We have tried to, you know, from um, infrasound um, detectors off the coast. We have tried to collect all sorts of data, any, any other data we can get our hands on, and we just don't have it just haven't been able to. We've gotten radar data from um, weather radar from two systems that um, do correlate and show there's something interesting going on there, but that's all, that's all we've been able to do. Josh asks, is Kevin aware of the anti-gravity research done by T. Townsend Brown in the 1940s, and does he think there's anything to it? I am aware of it. I don't know a lot about the details. Um, I've not really had time to dive into anti-gravity research. I do mostly, most of my work is um, exoplanet research. We've got a NASA grant to do that work now. And then the other work, I, theoretical work I do is more on foundational physics on where the laws of physics come from. Um, so I'm working at a different level there, but I've not really uh, dived into the anti-gravity literature. I like this question from Derek. This is a good one. I was I was jealous of thinking of this. So, if light beams are used to lift and attract objects along their length, and I think he's thinking about abductions here, how would you make light act like a physical object and withdraw along itself as if it was in some kind of sleeve? What other forces of nature would have to come into play? That's a good question. And, yeah, so it sounds like you're asking about the light that's observed during when people claim to be abducted. And those are, we, we call that solid light. Those are what's described as solid light particles. They, they look like particles. The beam, sometimes the beams are reported to come down and actually stop. They'll have a stopping point, um, which light does not do. 
Um, and um, there are things that they do that light doesn't do. So it's not clear that it's light. Um, and I have a whole file on solid, called solid light. And it's a file of just solid light cases, just people's descriptions of what appears to be solid light. Um, no idea what it is, possibly a new kind of particle. I don't know. But that's something that's interesting to me and I'm aware of and paying attention to when I can get anything on solid light, it gets thrown into that file. And um, hopefully something will spark an idea sometime, someday in the future. Kevin, have you still got 10 minutes to give us for a couple more questions? Sure, let's have some more questions. I like I like these. These are fun questions. Awesome. And I have cut out so many, I'm not even kidding. Um, listen, right. just, just before we get there, for anyone who's listening on the free feeds, thank you very much for your time. Um, the bonus section will be there for paid members. A few extra questions. There are free trials you can sign up to as well on Apple uh, and Patreon. You don't even have to keep on on. If you want to do it, listen and chuck it, then go for it. But from like a dollar, you can sign up and help support the podcast. So thank you very much. And there's all kind of bonus stuff on there. And um, before we get there, Kevin, just for the free feeds, uh, what's coming next for you and what you're currently working on what's coming next for me um two things um yeah this this the um the tedescos have they published their book their recent book here nightcrawler um on their investigations off the coast of long island and i am going there wednesday i'm just gonna check out what they're doing and hang out with them for a night um, that'll be great fun. So that's coming up this week. We're on break this week. So I have to find something fun to do. So that's what I'm going to do. Something related to my obsession that somebody has before. Um, and what am I doing research wise? I'm working on writing several papers. And again, this work is strategic in trying to build bridges with the scientific community. So the first paper is on interstellar colonization I'm actually giving a talk in the Kavli um, Astronomy Conference in Durham, England, in early or mid April. So I'll be oh, in April that is, giving a talk. That is I'm about sorry. half. That is about half an hour from where I live. So oh my god! All right, e email me. I'll meet up with you. I'll have coffee or something. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be there in mid April, Amazing. and I'll be there for a week. And so I'm giving a talk on. How, on my simulations of interstellar colonization. And I basically simulated a million civilizations and I kept track, keep track of which ones find earth. And then I can look at their statistics of what it takes for a civilization to find earth. So, um, so that's awesome. what I'm up to. Yeah. I'll drop you a message on that. That is very close. Yeah. To we'll life, get together. So. That'll be fun. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, oh, well, that was a bonus. Um, and speaking of bonuses, you can listen to a little bit more of Kevin. If you're on the paid feeds, you'll hear that follow straight on from this. Um, uh, same on the YouTube paid feeds, you'll see it go straight on. If you're on the free feeds, thank you very much. That's all from us. Uh, but Kevin, let's carry on with a few more listener questions. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic-tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Folk. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shut out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to...